Today we will be going through a full cardiac and peripheral vascular system assessment. Perform hand hygiene before entering the patient's room. Introduce yourself and ask for your patient's full name and date of birth. If in a hospital setting, verify the accuracy of this information with the patient's ID bracelet. If in a clinic setting where no bracelet is present, make sure the information the patient gives you matches previous documentation. Explain to the patient what you will be doing. In this case, I'll explain to my patient that I'm here to perform a full cardiac and peripheral vascular assessment. I'll tell them that I will be touching around the chest area, arms and legs, and also using my stethoscope to listen to their heart sounds over their chest. Always let your patient know that they have the right to refuse at any point and ask for their consent to continue. Make sure you have gathered all the relevant information needed before starting any physical assessment. In this case, I would have already done either a full health history or focused cardiac history and performed a PQRST IUA. All physical assessments must be done directly on the skin, whether you are inspecting, palpating, percussing, or auscultating. It is never to be done over clothing. For the purposes of this video, some assessments will be done over clothes. I will ask my patient to lie in bed and make sure they are comfortable. I will raise the height of the bed so that I'm comfortable and not hurting my back. First, I will start with inspecting the precordium. There are no visible pulsations present. There are no visible masses present. The skin color is uniform with the rest of the body. There is no cyanosis or pallor. Next, I will begin palpating to identify the five cardiac landmarks, which are the aortic area, pulmonic area, Herb's point, tricuspid area, and mitral area. I'm going to ask my patient to let me know if there is any tenderness while I'm palpating. Remember, tenderness is something that must be validated with the patient. First, I will start at the suprasternal notch and go down until I feel a protrusion, which is the angle of Louis. From the angle of Louis, I will go towards my patient's right side, which will bring me to the second rib. Then, one space down is the second intercostal space. The second intercostal space at the right sternal border is the aortic area. Then I will work my way over to the second intercostal space, left sternal border, which is the pulmonic area. I'll then go down to the third intercostal space, left sternal border, which is the mid precordial area or herbs point. Then I'll go down to the fifth intercostal space, left sternal border, which is the tricuspid area. Then I will work my way over to the fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line, which is the mitral area. If you look at your patient's clavicle and go halfway across, this is midclavicular. A good way to remember these five landmarks is the mnemonic, All People Enjoy Time magazine. My patient denied any tenderness. Now I will go over each landmark again to feel for any heaves. I'll use my fingertips and stay in each area for a few seconds to see if I feel anything bounding against my fingertips. This would be a heave and could indicate an enlarged heart. I did not feel any heaves at any of the landmarks. While I'm at the mitral area, I will feel for the apical impulse. This is not felt in everyone, only in about half of adults and will not be felt if someone has a thick chest wall or is obese. The location can vary slightly. It will either be at the fourth or fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line or just medial to it. I will ask my patient to turn to their left side to bring the heart closer to the chest wall, which will help me feel. With my patient, I'm able to feel the apical impulse. It is a gentle tap and small in diameter, about one to two centimeters. Be careful not to confuse the apical impulse for a heave and vice versa. Now I will go over each landmark with the ball of my hand to feel for any thrills. I'm feeling for any vibrations which would indicate a large murmur. In all five landmarks, there were no thrills. But I will still listen for murmurs with my stethoscope as smaller murmurs will not be palpable. Next, I will auscultate the different heart sounds using the diaphragm of my stethoscope. I'll make sure to keep my stethoscope on each landmark for at least a few heartbeats so I can really differentiate between S1 and S2. At the aortic area, S2 is louder than S1. At the pulmonic area, S2 is louder than S1. 
at Herb's point, S1 and S2 are equal. At the tricuspid area, S1 is louder than S2. At the mitral area, S1 is louder than S2. While at the mitral area, I'm going to take the apical heart rate. Lub dub is equal to one heartbeat. Here, I will count for a full minute and note the beats per minute and the rhythm. My patient's heart rate was 80 beats per minute with a regular rhythm. Next, I will listen over the same five landmarks with the bell. Now I'm listening for any extra heart sounds such as S3 or S4. If you hear any beats that are not identified as S1 or S2, then they are extra sounds. I'm also listening for any murmurs, which would sound like a whooshing sound. I will start at the aortic area. Now I'm at the pulmonic. Herb's point. Tricuspid area. Mitral area. No murmurs or extra heart sounds were heard at all five landmarks. With the bell of my stethoscope, I will listen at the carotids for any breweries. A brewery would sound like a whooshing sound and can indicate blockage in the artery. If you ever have difficulty distinguishing a brewery from a breath sound, you can ask the patient to hold their breath. Just make sure it's not for too long. I'll listen at three spots on each side. The angle of the jaw, mid cervical, and at the base of the neck. My patient had no breweries. Now that I have assessed the precordium, I will move on to assessing the peripheral vascular system. Ideally, the arms and legs would be completely exposed, so I will ask my patient to pull up the leggings to expose as much skin as possible. First, I will start with inspection. The skin color of the arms and legs are equal and uniform throughout with no signs of pallor or cyanosis. There is no visible ulcerations or visible edema. Hair distribution on both arms and legs is uniform throughout. Next, I will test capillary refill on two to three fingers per hand. I will do the same on the toes later on. I want to apply pressure until the nail bed blanches. And then when I release the pressure, the pink color should return within two to three seconds. Make sure to check this on both hands. Next, I will check for finger clubbing and test in two or three fingers. I will have the patient bring the same finger from each hand together with the nails facing one another to see if there's a small space in between. In this case, there is a space. Therefore, my patient does not have clubbed fingers. Next, I will test the skin turgor by pinching the skin under the clavicles. My patient's skin returns quickly to its original position, indicating good turgor. Next, I'll feel on the arms and legs for skin integrity and texture. My patient's skin is intact with a smooth texture. I did not see any visible edema, but I will also check for pitting edema on the arms and legs by applying pressure on the skin and seeing if an indentation is seen. For lower extremities, edema often starts at the ankles. My patient does not have any pitting edema. With the back of my hands, I will test my patient's skin temperature going from the top of the body and working my way downwards. The skin is warm to touch and equal bilaterally.
Next, I will finish by testing capillary refill on two to three toes on both feet. The pink color should return within two to three seconds. Remember, if you go towards the feet and then are going back towards the patient's head, you should wash your hands. Next, I will assess all the peripheral pulses. Due to COVID, I won't be touching near my patient's facial area, so I will show the temporal pulse on myself. The temporal artery will be found in front of the tragus of the ear. My temporal artery pulses were plus two and with a regular rhythm on both sides. For each pulse, I want to compare bilaterally, assess the rhythm and the force. I can feel both sides at the same time for all pulses except the carotid and popliteal. Now I will wash my hands before going back to my patient. First, I'm checking the carotid pulse one at a time. You can find this at the angle of the jaw. My patient's carotid pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Then I will find the brachial pulse on both sides. The brachial artery is found just above the antecubital fossa, medial to the bicep tendon. My patient's brachial pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Then I will find the radial pulse on both sides. This is found near the wrist in the groove that is in line with the patient's thumb. My patient's radial pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Next, I will find the femoral pulse on both sides. This is found in the groin region. My patient's femoral pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Next, I will find the popliteal pulse, which is found behind the knee. To find this pulse, you have to put quite a bit of pressure. To position yourself, anchor your thumbs on the knee and then curl your fingers around the back of the knee to help compress the artery. Make sure the patient's leg is relaxed. This pulse can be quite difficult to feel and may be a force of plus one in some people. My patient's popliteal pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Next, I'll find the posterior tibial pulse. This is located right behind the medial malleolus, which is the bony prominence of your inner ankle. My patient's posterior tibial pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. Next, I will find the dorsalis pedis pulse. You will be able to find this by following an imaginary line up your foot starting between your first two biggest toes. My patient's dorsalis pedis pulses were plus two in force and regular in rhythm on both sides. I'm now going to do the Allen test to ensure that the ulnar artery has good circulation. To do this, I will block the ulnar and radial artery that supply the hand with blood and have my patient clench and unclench their hand until the palm of their hand is blanched. Then I will release pressure from the ulnar artery while keeping pressure on the radial artery. The pink color returns within five seconds. Then I will repeat the same in the other hand as well. So you compress both arteries, have the patient clench and unclench until the hand is completely blanched, then release pressure on the ulnar artery and see the color return within five seconds. Next, I'll estimate my patient's jugular venous pressure or JVP. 
For this test, I want to be standing on the right side of my patient, ensure that there is no pillow, and ensure that the head of the bed is between 30 to 45 degrees. I will need two rulers. I will place one ruler at the angle of Louis. The part of the ruler touching the patient's chest should be at zero centimeters. I will have the patient turn their head to the left. I'm going to look for the internal jugular vein on the inner aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, but this cannot be seen in everyone. You can try and use a light to help visualize. Remember that a vein will not have a pulse, but will have an oscillation. If you are ever unsure if you are seeing the jugular vein or the carotid artery, apply pressure. If you still feel a pulse, then it is the artery that you have found and not the vein. If you cannot find the internal, the external jugular vein will still give an accurate reading. You can find the external on the outer portion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Once you have found the highest point of oscillation on the neck, bring the edge of the second ruler to that point, making sure that the two rulers form a 90 degree angle with one another. You are measuring from the bottom of the vertical ruler up to where the lower portion of the horizontal ruler meets the vertical ruler. The number on the vertical ruler showed one centimeter, but there is still a clear part of the ruler with no number attached to it. This equals around half a centimeter. One plus half brings us to 1.5 centimeters. My patient's JVP is therefore 1.5 centimeters, which is between the normal range of zero to three centimeters. After completing your health history and physical assessment, you will be able to identify your nursing care priority, provide relevant teaching and nursing interventions to help the patient with their situation. You should also be able to identify strengths and challenges that the patient has from the information gathered. Include follow-up instructions that demonstrate a collaborative approach with the patient. You always want to ensure that you and your patient have an equal understanding of the next steps. Make sure to thank your patient and ask them if they have any questions. Ensure they are comfortable and have the call bell in place in a hospital setting. Also make sure to bring the bed back to the lowest position and if in a hospital setting, you may put the bed rails back up as well. Make sure to wash your hands after having been in contact with your patient and their environment.